right, thanks for watching. And today I would like to talk about the polar coordinates formula, not the one you were taught, but the one you were supposed to be taught. And in fact, after you watch this video, you'll be like, oh my God, why didn't anyone tell me about this? Because the formula I present today is so much more natural than the one you know. Not only that, it also generalizes very nicely to n dimensions. So here's the setting. Suppose you have a function f of x that you're trying to integrate over the ball centered at zero and radius r. And by the way, the center actually doesn't matter here. Suppose you're trying to integrate it again over the ball centered at zero and radius r. So here's the idea. The idea is to think like an onion. Instead of integrating over the whole ball, first integrate on a little shell, okay? so, which is just a sphere centered at zero and radius r centered at zero and radius little r, so partial b zero r. So first integrate f on this little sphere. So partial b zero little r f of x. But here we have to use the measure on that little sphere, so ds of x. And then all you do, you just add up those little circles just like an onion, and adding up just means integrating. So you take whatever answer you have here, and you integrate little r from zero to capital R. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the polar coordinates formula, but again, the adult version, the one you should know, but not the one you were taught. And let me first of all illustrate an example just to show you that it is really the same thing as the polar coordinates formula, because you're probably like, where is the d theta? Where is the r dr? Well, it's all inside this ds of x. So for instance, let's say in r2, let's try to integrate the function 1 over square root of x squared plus y squared over the ball centered at zero and radius one. So dx dy, and again, technically I should write zero, zero, but I'll just abbreviate it as zero and radius one. Then again, what does this formula say? It says that first integrate on the sphere or here the circle centered at zero and radius one, and then and radius r, and then integrate over the radius. So what this becomes, it's just the integral, so the radius from zero to one, integral over the circle, b zero r, one over square root of x squared plus y squared, and um, the, if you want the surface uh, measure over the, um, over that circle, and then the r. And the cool thing is you don't even need to know what this surface measure is in this case, because it'll be something familiar. Now, uh, if we're on this uh, circle of radius little r, this thing, one over square root of x squared plus y squared, it just simplifies to one over r. So all you have to do is integrate the function one over r, over that circle. So ds xy dr, and again, the beautiful thing, this comes out. And so you're left with the integral from zero to one, the integral over the, the circle, sorry, one over r over the circle of, if you want, one, ds xy dr, and the important thing is the integral of one over any region is the volume or area or here the length of the region. So this becomes the integral from zero to one of one over r. Again, the length of this circle and then dr. So again, we have the circle centered at zero and radius r while the perimeter of this is two pi r. 
0, 1, 1 over r, 2 pi r. The r, which kind of explains what this surface measure is. So in this case, all it is, uh, it's basically r d theta. Because you see, this r pops out and this 2 pi, you just get it from integrating the function 1 with respect to theta. So in fact, uh, this is really the same as the polar coordinates formula in two dimensions. And just to finish this problem, this becomes uh, the integral of 2 pi from 0 to 1, which gives you 2 pi. So that's very good. And All right, but that doesn't explain why it's so useful. The awesome thing is this polar coordinates formula not only works in two dimensions, but in any dimensions. So this thing where you integrate, again, over any ball really, d zero r f of x dx equals integral from zero to r over all the shells. So f of x the s of x, the r. Again, this is valid for any uh, dimension. And in fact, if you try it out in three dimensions, it turns out the surface, you know, the surface measure on the sphere is just uh, r squared uh, sine of phi d theta d phi. Again, depending on which convention you use for theta and phi. So this is in spherical coordinates. And you can use this by just calculating the tangent vectors and crossing them and taking the length. And then eventually you find that. But um, that's for another time. All right, and not only that, and again, I'll give another example at the end just to show how to do it in n dimensions. But I do wanna, while I still have your attention, I do wanna say what's awesome about this as well is that it generalizes. And let me tell you for a second about the co-area formula. So what did we do here? We tried to integrate uh, over this region, which is the, um, the ball. And the idea was, well, you just decompose it into little uh, shells and you add up the shells. Now, what if instead of integrating over the ball, you want to integrate your function over some weird wobbly region okay, called the, again, smooth, even though it doesn't look like that way. Well, suppose you can decompose D into level surfaces or just think shells. where the level surfaces are just given by h equals t. All right, so you have this function h and the surface level surface is given by h equals t. Then the co-area formula tells you the following. Namely, suppose you want to integrate a function f dx over the region D. It turns out it's not quite the function F, but because this H could have kinks or wobbles, you have to take into account how much it moves. So it's really integral of F times length of the gradient of H, which again, most cases is one. So just really think integral of F equals to the following. So you integrate over all the radii, so before it was r, but here you integrate with respect to t. And again, t could be negative. So from negative infinity to infinity over each shell, which is each level surface okay, of f of x. Now, before we had the surface measure of the sphere or something, here you just have to replace it by what's called the n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure. I know, uh, a lot to be swallowed, but it's basically, if this is two dimensional, it's just a one dimensional measure called the Hausdorff measure. And you integrate that with respect to uh, whatever radius you have. So this is the integral over every shell, and then you integrate it over all the shells. 
And this is the co-area formula. And you can actually check that the polar coordinates formula is the co-area formula where h is just given, let's say, in two dimensions just by square root of x squared plus y squared. You get the, the stuff we usually want. All right, and last but not least, as promised, let me give you an example of uh, this uh, polar coordinates formula, again, in n dimensions. And as I said, since I like PDEs, uh, let me give you a little PDE example. So in PDEs, there's this thing called the fundamental solution of Laplace's equation, phi of x which is just a constant depending on the dimension m of x to the n minus two, where this constant is given by n one over m times n minus two over alpha n. Where alpha n, all it is, is just the volume of the ball of center zero and radius r. And the problem is this function could blow up. So it kind of looks like this. Yet what I want to show you is, if you integrate this function phi of x over a small ball, you actually get something nice. So something that doesn't blow up. So again, you want to integrate this function phi over the ball centered at zero in radius or epsilon. So again, the um, polar coordinates formula is very handy. So integrate. Uh, first of all, with respect to the radius, so integral from zero to epsilon dr, and then integrate phi over the sphere centered at zero in radius r, so not epsilon, but r. All right, let's see what this becomes. So this is cn, so not cnn, and if the, on the sphere, the radius constant equal to r, so it's r to the n minus two. Again, surface uh, measure, so the s of x, uh, the r. And again, the beautiful thing is, just like the last example, uh, this whole thing comes out. It's crazy. I'm teaching you so much math in this little video. Isn't that awesome? So this comes out and then we have this. So just the integral of one of dsx dr. And, and again, just like the previous example, if you integrate the function one, then uh, the integral just becomes the surface area in this case of this ball, of this sphere. Now, just a little recap in case you don't know, and there is another video on this, but um, the volume of the ball equals to r to the n times the volume of the unit ball. And there has been another video on this, and you can just do it uh, with, the, um, with the Jacobian, so change of variables. But again, just to illustrate in three dimensions, this becomes 4 thirds pi r3. So this is r3 part, and this is just the volume of the ball of radius one. So it's just really alpha three by definition. So that's the volume of the ball. And the cool thing is to get the surface area of the sphere, just differentiate this. And again, I have done a video on this. So n alpha and r to the n minus one. So what this becomes, it's n alpha n, r to the n minus one. So this becomes r to the n minus one over r to the n minus two. And what this simplifies to integral zero to epsilon, you have the cn, you have r to the n minus one over r to the n minus two, which is r, and you still have n alpha n, the r, but then and the, Everything is a constant except for r, so it becomes cn and literally cnn alpha n, and an antiderivative of this is r squared over two, so epsilon squared over two, and last but not least, 
remember the definition of Cn that becomes n over n minus 2 alpha n, n alpha n, epsilon squared over 2, beautiful cancellations. And what we're left with is simply the integral of the fundamental solution over this ball is just um, epsilon squared over 2 times n minus 2, which is just a constant times epsilon squared. In particular, as you let epsilon go to 0, this goes to 0, so it doesn't blow up. So this is one of the many illustrations of the polar coordinates formula, and in particular, how they uh, apply to PDEs. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.